Well, here we are in the Holy Land. Welcome here. We are at Tel Gilgal. So at this biblical site, we'll be looking at the location of this place and why that's so important. We'll talk about the historical background of this location. We'll be looking at some of the amazing places of interest at this site. We'll see the key events in the Bible that took place here. And we'll end with the faith lesson in order to learn the major lessons God desires for us from this important biblical site. So I think you'll find this video very enlightening and transforming to your life. Uh, there's a number of places in Israel that they have discovered that have the shape of a human foot. So when the Israelites crossed into the promised land, they would camp and they would build with their camps. They would make it like the shape of a right human foot because as the promise was given to Abraham, wherever your foot trods or goes, it will be yours. So there's an altar here that has been erected by Joshua. We're gonna be looking at some stuff in here, but more than that, there is a lot of biblical things that happened right here. It's really, really rich in biblical history. So that's why we've come here. We are about eight miles north of Jericho and just a few miles west of the Jordan River. Now it appears in scripture that there are two Gilgals. There was a camp Gilgal. That's where the Israelites set up their camp right after they crossed the Jordan River and first entered into the promised land. But it appears later that they established a more permanent dwelling a little bit north of the camp Gilgal. So in this particular teaching and video, we're gonna be talking about Camp Gilgal, which was down by Jericho, and the permanent Tel Gilgal, which is right here. And once again, there have been discoveries found here that give great weight to the fact that this was the more permanent uh, Gilgal. And we can see the valley below us. There was plenty of place, there was water, plenty of place to uh, camp and to stay. But it was more of a permanent residence. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about some historical background here about this place and about this human footprint shape that's here that we're gonna be seeing. The late professor Adam Zertal from the university here in Haifa, Israel, did much research on the biblical location of Gilgal and discovered that it's very likely, very possible, it wasn't necessarily a specific location, but a common name for a camp or religious site in its early period. In Zertal's research, he discovered six sites where the Israelites could have camped after crossing the Jordan into the Promised Land. Each place is uniquely shaped like a human right footprint. Very interesting. This is likely attributed to the promise given to them in Deuteronomy 11.24. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your border will be from the wilderness to Lebanon and from the river, the river Euphrates, as far as the Western Sea. So we believe that from Deuteronomy that when the Israelites came in, they would, they would camp and then they would build their camps in the shape, part of it in the shape of a human footprint. Now in Joshua 4.19, it places Gilgal, the Camp Gilgal, on the eastern edge of Jericho. Okay, right in between the Jordan River and Jericho, it says in Joshua 4.19. Now the people came up from the Jordan River on the 10th day of the first month and camped at Gilgal on the eastern edge of Jericho. Now the place of Tel Gilgal doesn't fit with the Camp Gilgal. So once again, we believe that there's two places. And then the research indicates that it appears there were two places and that Gilgal is not necessarily a pinpointed place, but a location. But it does appear by what has been discovered here that this was the more permanent camp that lasted for some time that we'll be looking at in our Bible time here. If Zertal's claims are true, then it's very possible that Tel Gilgal was the more permanent Gilgal that is referred to 35 times in Scripture. And the place on the eastern edge of Jericho was a temporary place where the Israelites camped. This seems reasonable as there are no remains of any permanent city on the eastern edge of Jericho. So no discoveries have been made that show any indication 
of anything permanent. Whereas in here at modern day Gilgal, there have been many discoveries uh, found. So therefore, once again, we'll refer to this site as Tel Gilgal in our talk, and we'll refer to the Camp Gilgal across from Jericho as the Camp Gilgal. And once again, that seems to be the temporary place where they stayed at, and this seems to be the permanent location that's mentioned throughout scripture. Now Tel Gilgal, right here, became a central meeting place throughout the rest of the Old Testament and appears to have been a smaller city. So it wasn't a large city, it was more of a center of gathering. Now there are some places of interest here that have been discovered that we want to point out to you here at this Tel Gilgal. Well one, we're filming right by this tower. This is more of a modern day tower that just marks this spot, but once again, Whenever we see a lot of historical background at a site, it does help us to believe that there's significance here. Otherwise, you wouldn't have all these uh, people doing things for all this uh, length of time here. And then there's this heel part of the footprint shape at Tel Gilgal, and that's gonna be right over here. The, the heel's here, and the toe and the front part of the foot is down below towards the palms, and we'll be walking and, and looking at that. There was a tabernacle here. We can see some remains of a tabernacle. There's some remains of a 12 stone monument. And it appears that this monument, these 12 stones were moved from the, the temporary Camp Gilgal up here to the permanent Tel Gilgal because they found a 12, a 12 stone monument here. There's been found an altar here. And once again, the toe part of the footprint is down towards the lower part. So then uh, right here you can see uh, I'm standing in the heel of this uh, footprint. And then the toes and stuff are down there. But as we go down, we're going to be seeing the, uh, this uh, temple that was here and this altar. Once again, this is very old. We're talking 3,600 years. But this area right here is uh, the footprint of this uh, shape that they made here. In this lower part of the heel is where the uh, tabernacle was right in this area here, this flat area right in here, be the tabernacle part. Now this area right here is a close up of where the 12 stone monument would have been. Now obviously this is very, very old so there's not much left of it now. Okay, so anyway, here would have been the altar. As you can see, it's down below where the tabernacle and the 12 stone altar would have been. It's in the toe part of the print of this heel-shaped area, and it's round in nature. So this is the believed place where the altar would have been. And then, of course, Jericho is two hour south, about eight miles, and then the Jordan River is just in front of me or east of us, just a couple miles. And then once again, Camp Gilgal would be placed just east of Jericho, what we believe is the temporary Gilgal. So that's kind of the lay of the land and a little bit of the historical background of Camp Gilgal and the permanent Gilgal. Once again, we believe this is the permanent uh, Gilgal because of the altar that's been found here, the 12 stones, the shape of a human footprint. So all these things just seem to give great evidence that this is the, the permanent site of Gilgal. So now we're going to look in the Bible of some significant things. A lot of things happened here, and that's why we're here. As we said, some places are aesthetically pleasing, they're beautiful. Some places don't have a lot of beauty because they've just been kind of forgotten. And we should mention, we've indicated that in Israel, only about 2% of all of the uh, historical biblical sites have been excavated. So they've just got this land rich with history, but it's been very little uh, excavated. So this is one of the sites, it's, it's marked out, we'll see some stuff, but it's not really a tourist spot, but once again, it has so much rich biblical history that we wanted to come here and talk about this. So, Camp Gilgal, that's east of Jericho, is the first place the Israelites camped after crossing the Jordan River and entering the Promised Land. Now tomorrow, we're gonna be at uh, the baptismal site of Jesus, which is the believed place also where the Israelites crossed into the Promised Land. And that miracle is quite astounding. I'll just give you a little teaser. The water backed up about 20 or 30 miles. 
it was about, it, it formed a dam when they crossed because the water was running at flood stage. And so God stopped the water and the water formed a dam as it backed up. It was about two miles wide. It was about 120 feet deep and it went up into the Jordan Valley about uh, 20 or 30 miles, roughly. And we'll be talking about, about that tomorrow. It's, it's, I mean, the miracle is far larger than what we probably think when we've maybe been to Sunday school or we've heard about it. So when they first, when the Israelites first crossed the Jordan River, they camped at Camp Gilgal, and that's the Camp Gilgal right east of Jericho. And at Camp Gilgal, Joshua erected 12 stones taken from the Jordan River as a monument of remembrance. It says in Joshua 4.18, it came about when the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came up from the middle of the Jordan and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up to the dry ground that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and went over all its banks as before. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and camped at Gilgal on the eastern edge of Jericho. Those 12 stones which they had taken up from the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. He said to the sons of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea. And you see this duplication of miracles, and you'll see that quite regularly. Which he dried up before us until we had crossed that all the peoples of the earth, that everyone may know, not, not just them, but so all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So once again, we just see that the nation of Israel was a mouthpiece, was a vehicle through which God wanted to speak and show his glory to all of the world. But that happened at Camp Gilgal. But once again, it appears the stones were moved up here because they have been found. Now, Camp Gilgal was the first place the Israelites celebrated the Passover after entering the Promised Land. And Camp Gilgal is just about eight miles or about 12 kilometers south of here, so it's not very far. It says, while the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. And it was at Gilgal that the Gibeonites tricked the Israelites into making a covenant with them so they wouldn't be destroyed. So the Gibeonites are just northwest of Jerusalem, just about five or eight miles, and they came down here to Gilgal to make a covenant, and they tricked Joshua. It says in jo Joshua 9.3, well, I shouldn't say they tricked Joshua. I should say that, the Joshua, that Joshua failed to ask the Lord. Now, they were deceitful, but Joshua did not pray about this, so therefore he was deceived. It says in Joshua 9.3, when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they also acted craftily and set out as envoys and took worn out sacks on their donkeys and wineskins worn out and torn and mended and worn out and patched sandals on their feet and worn out clothes on themselves and all the bread of their provisions was dry and had become crumbled. They went to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, we have come from a far country, now therefore make a covenant with us and Joshua did make a covenant with them, once again, because he failed to pray. So Gilgal was the place from which Caleb, one of the two faithful spies Moses sent to spy out the promised land, asked Joshua for his portion of the land. We're going to make a transition now. At this particular time now, we're a little bit later. It seems that the Israelites have moved more to the permanent place, the permanent Gilgal, so it's probably right here now that the rest of what I'm going to tell you takes place. We don't exactly know exactly when that transition happened, but it's likely somewhere at this point. It says in Joshua 4, 6, Then the sons of Judah drew near to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenesite said to him, You know the word of the Lord, 
which the Lord spoke to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me at Kadesh Barnea. And Kadesh Barnea is in the south part of the Negev when they were going to enter the Promised Land. And Joshua and Caleb were two of the faithful spies. The other ten were not, said we can't do it. So as a result, they, then they wandered for 40 years in the desert. All of, the, all of those 20 years and older died, so it was only the second generation now that come in. But Joshua and Caleb are the only two that remain out of the first generation. So it was right here that Caleb asked for his possession. And he says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought word back to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt with fear. But I followed the Lord my God fully. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden will be an inheritance to you and to your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God fully. And it says in Joshua 14, 13, So Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb for an inheritance. And then Hebron is about uh, 30 miles south of Jerusalem. That was the area that Caleb received. Now we're going to move forward in time about 400 years after Joshua. And once again, it appears that after Joshua or, or some point during that time, this became the permanent Gilgal. So the conquest of the Promised Land took place in about 1406 B.C. The time of Saul is roughly around 1000 B.C. So now we advance the narrative, we advance, advance the story, the timeline, about 400 years. Now we're in the time of the prophet Samuel and Saul. Once again, this place now is the, seems to be the permanent Gilgal at that time. It says in, that the prophet Samuel visited and taught the word of God regularly at Till Gilgal. So we know that it became a permanent place. And once again, it, we haven't found any archaeological evidence uh, across from east of Jericho which shows any permanent uh, place of dwelling. So that's why it seems like that was the temporary place and then once they got established then they moved up here to a more permanent place. So it says that Samuel came here on a regular basis preaching the word. It says in 1 Samuel 7:15, Now Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He used to go annually on a circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah and he judged Israel in all these places. So Samuel would have been here. Uh, Joshua would have been here. Okay? Saul was anointed here. He was made the first king over Israel here in Gilgal. So once again, there's a lot of things that happen here. It says in 1 Samuel 11, Then Samuel said to the people, Come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. So they also offered sacrifices and peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. So right here in Gilgal. Now Tel Gilgal was a central gathering place for the Israelites for many years. It says in 1 Samuel 13:4. All Israel heard the news that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines and also that Israel had become odious or despised or rejected by the Philistines. The people were then summoned to Saul at Gilgal. Now also, King Saul's reign over Israel came to an end here at Tel Gilgal because of his disobedience. So he was anointed here king. And then he, his reign is going to end here as king. It says in 1 Samuel 13, and this was because of his disobedience. Now he waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel. So just a little brief backdrop is that the Philistines were hard pressing on Israel. Uh, Saul was under extreme pressure. The armies were gathering all around him, but Samuel had told him, the prophet Samuel had told him to wait and I will come and I will offer a sacrifice for the battle and bless you. So they were gathered here and Saul uh, waits and waits and Samuel doesn't arrive. And so Saul does something that was forbidden. He 
as a king, not as a priest, he had no right to, he offered the sacrifice and gave the blessing. So then afterwards, the prophet Samuel shows up. So uh, Saul had waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So once again, he's under this great pressure. The, these Philistine armies are gathering around him. Uh, Samuel's not here, and he's losing control, and he's in this state of panic, uh, life and death, so to speak. And it said, all the people were scattering from him. Verse 9, so Saul said, bring to me, this is Saul, Saul said, bring to me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to greet him. But Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the appointed days, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, therefore I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, right here, and I have not asked the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Once again, we can see in the life of Samuel, we saw it yesterday at uh, Beth Shean, that Saul always presumed upon the grace of God and did things that he wasn't supposed to do, just using his own logic. He always had an excuse. And today, many believers, uh, we do the same. So he said, I forced myself to, to offer this burnt offering. Verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord, your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, that's talking about David, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over all his people. Because you have not kept the word the Lord has commanded you, or not kept what the Lord has commanded you. So it's right here, or in this area, is where Saul lost his kingship because of his disobedience. And we talked in another faith lesson about how those in leadership, the decisions they make are far greater than people under their authority because it influences a lot of people. So kings and queens and presidents and, and rulers should be very careful. And we that are in leadership, whether it be ministries or whatever, we should be very careful about our decisions because what we do affects many under us. So to whom much is given, much more is required. And that's why it says in James, not let many of you be teachers because you will incur a stricter judgment. Those in authority will have great rewards, but if their authority is used poorly or foolishly, then they will uh, suffer loss, greater loss, consequences. And then later on, God pronounced judgment upon Israel at Tel Gilgal because of their disobedience to him. It says in Hosea 9.15, all their evil is at Gilgal. Indeed, I came to hate them there. Interesting. Right here at Gilgal, God just became increasingly angry with the Israelites here and grew disgusted with them. Because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels. Now, as a result, we know that the northern tribes, 10 tribes, are going to go into deportation by the Assyrians. And then we know that later on, under the Babylonians, by the Babylonians, the two southern tribes, Judah, will go into captivity. Then in Amos 5, 4, it says, For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live, but do not resort to Bethel, and do not come to Gilgal, nor cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal will certainly go into captivity and Bethel will come to trouble. So once again, you see that, that Gilgal played a significant role in the conquest, that it was a central place. And then all throughout uh, Israel's history, it was a central gathering place and, play, and played a key role. And it was here that Saul was anointed. It was here he lost his kingship. And it was here that God grew angry with the nation of Israel because of their continual disobedience. And then, of course, he would lead them into deportation as a result. So, 
What are some faith lessons that we can learn and apply to ourselves today? There's always these principles that God is teaching that apply to us. Scripture says in Romans and 1 Corinthians that these things were written beforehand for examples for us today. So what, what can we learn from what happened here? Well, like the Israelites who took 12 stones out of the Jordan River to mark the fulfillment of God's miracle in bringing them into the promised land, we too should set up remembrances. They don't have to be physical, they could be, but we should try to have markers and remember what God has done for us. Also, so that we can teach our children that 12 stones not only represented what God had done, but were to be used for succeeding generations so that it was uh, tools, vehicles, through which fathers, mothers, aunts and uncles could teach these truths of what God had done, leading them out of the promised land, supplying their needs in the wilderness, leading them into the promised land through crossing the Jordan. So they were tools of remembrance, and we should too should do the same. And like Caleb, who was faithful and trusting God, we should emulate his faith. There were approximately 3.5 million Jews who left Egypt, came out of Egypt. Only two went into the promised land. And Caleb was one of them because of his faith. He was a man of faith. And it says later on, I didn't read it, but when he went to conquer Hebron, which is kind of a mountain, he said to, to Moses, he was 80 years old. He said he hadn't lost his vigor or his strength, probably kept himself in good you know, physical shape. He said, give me that mountain. He had waited 40 years. He had waited 40 years for his inheritance. He had tolerated all of Israel's wickedness. He had spent you know, 40 years wandering with them as a result of their wickedness. He had no fault. He was not to blame, but he paid the price for the sins of those around him, and we often do too as well. So when he was, when it was time, he said, give me that mountain and give it to me. And he went up and conquered it. Now, unlike Joshua, who failed to pray and seek the Lord regarding the trickery of the Gibeonites, we should pray and seek the Lord regarding our decisions, regarding our ministry decisions, regarding what we're going to do. Joshua failed to do that, and the Gibeonites tricked him. And once again, we should heed the warnings of King Saul's life. He was anointed here, and his, his reign came to an end here. Why? Because of simple disobedience. And once again, the disobedience and sin of leaders affects those under them. And lastly, we shouldn't be like the Israelites who were up and down all the time and then gradually turned away from the Lord and then were deported uh, we should not be like them. Our faith, even though we might have emotions up and down, but a person who walks with the Lord and then falls away or, or you know, then comes back to the Lord and then falls away, that's the sign of a spiritually immature person. We don't base our walk with the Lord on our emotions. We base those on the solid rock, which is our spiritual disciplines, our obedience to Him. Uh, God is with us regardless of how we feel. And once again, what marks whether or not we're in right fellowship is not just an emotion, although an emotion is important, but it's not just an emotion. It's, are we in fellowship with the Lord? Am I obeying the Lord? Am I walking with the Lord? Am I reading His Word? Am I praying? Those are markers, not just because we do them. That means we're right, but once again, uh, the Israelites were up and down all the time, up and down. And the person who walks with the Lord and then you know, falls away from the Lord and then gets back on track, that's just a sign of spiritual immaturity. So here we are at this Tel Gilgal, and as you can see, it's really rich. It's really rich when you think about all that happened uh, right here. And you can maybe just go back in time and picture Joshua here, camped out here, and then later on you can envision Saul here. You can envision Samuel here. You can envision, you know, these many things that happened uh, right here, and it was a central gathering place. So a lot of people would gather together. So here we are at uh, this Tel Gilgal, and once again, rich, rich uh, things happened here and some great lessons of faith for us here. So 
Thank you for your input, your thoughts, and those watching by video. God bless you, and uh, we'll continue to move on and see many more things here in the Holy Land.